Welcome to the Kerrville Bible Church Pastors Podcast, where we seek to encourage and equip you in your walk with Christ by exploring a variety of biblical and theological topics. Stay tuned to the end of the episode to learn how you can submit a question for us to answer on the podcast. Welcome back to the Kerrville Bible Church Pastors Podcast. My name is Toby Baxley, and uh, we are coming to you from our lovely podcast studio here on the second floor of our Family Life Center gym. And it is Election Day uh, 2024. Uh, and well, what, the day that we're recording this. Well, yeah, yeah, day. sure. Yeah. You're, you're going to hear it uh, the, in the a- in aftermath, the day after. Uh, and so we have no prophetic uh, thoughts about what is going to happen Today or Scott doesn't have any overnight. utterances. No utterances. No, no Scott, utterances do you have an Scott? utterance? I, I no do utterances. Not. No. I cannot say that I do. <laughs> all all we know is that this is the most election ever, and we're. Uh, I'm I'm glad for it to be over. The to, most election. Ever. And God is mostly in control. <laughs> most, One way speaking, or the other, it'll be over. And speaking of election. Hmm. Ooh, Our, a nice segue. Wow. Yeah. Speaking wow. of election, so, I like that. So anyway, I think you know these guys, but that's Murray, <laughs> and we've got Chris McKnight and Scott Christensen as my uh, faithful co-hosts of uh, this podcast. And and yeah, speaking of election, we're, we want to talk about election and, and not really election, but the Arminianism and the five points of Arminianism, because there, there are five points, and to sort of counterbalance, not counterbalance, but it's, it's, almost, it's in opposition to the five points of Calvinism. And so as we help you, as we help you guard your life, guard your doctrine, we want to help you with these, uh, these thoughts today on uh, Arminianism and and sovereign grace theology. So, Chris, what do you got? Well, it is uh, my turn to host in our ongoing series. I guess this is part five of our Guard the Flock series, and um, we don't know if it's the last or not. But uh, I did want to kind of mention the several topics that I was also thinking about talking about today. Uh, this was in our that lost out that lost out yeah uh, in the election I, said, I want to mention in passing <clears throat> uh, some several other things and and I'm so much of a brain fog right now with my ongoing cold that I don't even remember what those are now so <laughs> but let's see if I can think of what uh, some other things were going to be like for instance uh, prosperity gospel of course is a huge threat to everybody uh, with their uh, false teachers of Joel Osteen Joyce Meyer. Uh, Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Copeland, with Benny Hinn, a long list of, you know, I thought about the names of people that uh, are a threat uh, to uh, good Christian teaching and sound theology. Um, There's some other things that were going through my mind that we could talk about as well. Um, but I'm drawing a blank at the moment, so I want to get to this because uh, one thing I thought about was we talked about. Uh, Legalism, self-righteousness, Hebrew Roots Movement. Where did you start us off? Christian, Christian, Christian nationalism. nationalism. So I, I was thinking about those three things, uh, and I was thinking about the common denominator between them, the common link in a lot of ways. And, it, and, and the common denominator is there's too much of us in all of them. There's too much of man's uh, uh, will, man's, man's thinking, man's uh, works uh, as, a, as, a, as a way to... Uh, live the Christian life, um, so to speak. And so what is the correction for that? What is the antidote for uh, what is the common thread in all of those things you guys have talked about? And it is really God having his rightful place in, in his universe and God having his rightful place in salvation and in sanctification. And I don't think anything does this better than really understanding the doctrines of grace. Um, nothing gets us, puts us in our place, and puts God in His, you know, place of sovereign power and authority and and rights. You know, God is the one with the free will, ultimately, not us. And we'll talk about that. But uh, this is the cure for legalism and self righteousness. 
Mm-hmm. This is this. Uh, this is the cure. The Hebrew Roots Movement is uh, going back to the law, going back to I'm going to try to do these certain things to either gain merit or keep God's favor in my life or, you know, whatever. And and so, um, anyhow, th- th- this is this is the solution of all solutions to me. And it's uh, Arminianism is a is is a danger at all times to sound Christianity. There's no question about it. Uh, The other thing that these have in common is, as you guys talked about those three groups, we would recognize that there could be genuine believers in all of them. Mm -hmm. There could be genuine believers who are misled and caught up in Christian nationalism, the Hebrew Roots Movement, and and any of us as Christians can fall into legalism and and self-righteousness. So this one has that same common link. Uh, Arminianism and Arminians— could be Christians. We recognize that. We acknowledge that. And many times people are Christians first, and they they adopt those beliefs, and they eventually, I would say, grow out of them, right? They move away from them and and, uh, and adopt a more biblical viewpoint of things. And so uh, we're recognizing today from the outset that though some Christians have called these things heretical, we can dis- debate that as doctrines, we would still recognize that there are genuine Christians uh, who believe the opposite of us mm. in, on this, uh, just like there's genuine Christians caught up in prosperity gospel at times and, and, and uh, other, other movements. So with that, let me, let me jump into a little bit of history, uh, because I know our people like content at times, not just, uh, um, not just our, our opinion about the content. So let me, let me give a little... Uh, uh, history lesson on this. Uh, this comes from a little book called Tulip, The Five Points of Calvinism in the Light of Scripture by Dwayne Spencer. Uh, and so he starts uh, with the discussion of the five points of Arminianism, which Toby's referred to. Um, these really came first in response to the Reformation, big picture, and then the five points of Calvinism were in response to these five points of Arminianism. A Dutch theologian named Jacob Hermann, who lived from 1560 to 1609, was best known by the Latin form of his last name, Arminius. Although reared in the Reformed tradition, Arminius leaned toward the humanist doctrines of Erasmus, for he had serious doubts about sovereign grace as it was preached by the Reformers. His disciples, called Arminians uh, and Remonstrants, expanded the teaching of their master. Several years after his death, they formulated his doctrines into five main points known as the five points of Arminianism. Since the churches of Netherlands, of the Netherlands, in common with other major Protestant churches of Europe, had subscribed to the Reformed doctrines of the Belgic and Heidelberg Confessions, the Arminians determined to present the Dutch Parliament with a remonstrance. This carefully written protest of the Reformed faith was submitted to the state of Holland, and, and check this out, this is, this is what people don't know most of the time about this. And in 1618, a national synod of the church was convened in Dort to examine the teachings of Arminius in the light of Scripture. Okay? After 154 earnest sessions, which lasted seven months, the five points of Arminianism were found contrary to Scripture and declared heretical. At the same time, the theologians of the church reaffirmed the position held by the Protestant reformers as consistent with Scripture, and they formulated what's known as the five points of Calvinism, uh, again, after Calvin's death. Over the years, the studied reply of the Synod of Dort to the heresies of Arminius had been set forth in the form of an acrostic forming the word tulip. T, total depravity, U, unconditional election, L, limited atonement, I, irresistible grace, P, perseverance of the saints. So uh, I think as we as we begin, we got to kind of walk through the five points of Arminianism, uh, and I'll, I'll 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 say a little bit about this, and then let you guys kind of chime in, make comments about it. What uh, from from that standpoint, a little commentary. So their their first point is free will, or we might call their first point partial depravity. Right? You could go either way. Uh, reading from Spencer's book, uh, the first point of Arminianism was that man possesses free will. The Reformers acknowledged that man had a will, but they agreed with Luther's thesis in his book, The Bondage of the Will, that it was not free from bondage to Satan. Arminius believed that the fall of man was not total, so depravity is partial, holding that there was enough good left in man for him 
to will to accept Christ unto salvation. So there's a fall, but not a total fall. Uh, the man's entire being's not corrupted. He still has a will free enough that when given the option, right, when given the offer, he has a will uh, free enough to choose um, to choose God, to choose Christ. All right, comments on on this first on this first point, guys. Either side of it, the the total depravity side, or the partial, or the free will side. Yeah, I think. I think this goes back to something. I think it was something you said at family camp in regard to to regeneration and uh, the idea that what is the state of our depravity prior to being regenerated? And, of course, Scripture speaks, you know, particularly in Ephesians 2, that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And I think the Arminian view kind of mitigates that. It doesn't say that we are without sin or we don't have some level of depravity, but that depravity is mitigated by the fact that there is this sort of island of goodness, you might say, or, or you know, or this free will that, that we have to overcome whatever depravity we have. And so I think a good way of illustrating that is that they see our condition as sick right. and not really being not dead. completely dead. So, so, you know, in, in the Calvinist view, we we have no ability whatsoever to do anything with our condition. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the Arminian view, we're sick. Yeah, we're kind of debilitated, but we still we still can kind of reach out and and, and grab hold right. of something right. to help us. It's the illustration of drowning versus drowned. Yeah, uh, and the Arminians would say we're drowning, and the life preserver comes to us, and we can swim to it and take hold of it and be saved. And the Calvinists would say, we've already drowned. We're laying at the bottom of the ocean. Someone has to swim down to us, take us out, resuscitate us, yes. right? Yeah. Uh, shock our hearts, give us, you know, that, that whole picture of, of uh, rescuing a dead man, essentially. Uh, and, and so those two, that's two ways to, two contrasting illustrations uh, of that. So, so yeah. I want to back up just a little bit. I think it would be helpful for the, sure. for the listener is uh, a general idea of Arminianism versus Calvinism is our Arminianism is big man theology and has man generally at the center. They would never say that they bring God down, but they would definitely elevate man. So it's big man theology and Calvinism is big God theology. And you started with that when in your introduction about that it's God centered. Mm-hmm, that right. that's the, those are two big categories, man centered or God centered. And then we have a high, Calvinists have a high view of Scripture, and Arminians have to have a lower view of Scripture in order to fit their, their system. They have to have a lower view of Scripture of, of the f- full counsel of God to make it work. Even to the degree, I was a youth pastor at a Methodist church. I wasn't Methodist, but I was a missionary in the Methodist church. <laughs> and that they'll even say, you've made an idol out of the Bible, and right. you, you, have, you have elevated God's word above Jesus and above the Holy Spirit. And, and the Bible is – I've heard this from Methodist pastors. The Bible is not God's inerrant, infallible word. It's inspirational, but not inspired, not breathed out, right? And so that is the premise and the presuppositions that we're entering this conversation of Arminianism versus Calvinism. So I think that is helpful to know in the onset. So. Right, and because of that, historically, um, and of course man can ruin and has ruined anything and everything, but historically, doctrines of grace and Calvinism, because we believe it is more true to the Bible, it's biblical theology, um, has been an anchor for sound doctrine, where um, preserving churches and denominations longer than Arminianism generally would. Um, I, I would argue that if, if you know we don't, we're not going to take the time to analyze it to this level, but I think if, if we were to think about all the threats against the, the, the Christian Church in 21st century America, if we were to think about the point of this series of guarding the flock and, and guarding ourselves from error and from false teachers and false teaching, I would argue that by and large, most all of them have an underpinning of Arminianism. Uh, that most all of them can be traced back to this this issue of 
who is God in our salvation and how are we actually saved? Right. And, and so, so many errors, you know, each one of these five points can branch off into a list of errors that are related to them. Um, so many errors in evangelism, errors in missions, errors in counseling, errors in preaching, errors in worship, errors in songwriting. Error, I mean, you just everything. go all down. It informs books, everything. It informs everything. everything. You think of all the big, big books that have been the popular, uh, you know, million do- million sellers. Uh, a lot of times it's it's got this uh, Armenian underpainting because it appeals to the flesh. Yeah, man-centered. <laughs> it's yeah. man-centered. We love to be told we yeah. can do certain things mm-hmm. and, 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 and believe in yourself and and chase your dream, all the all the infection. Okay, even the so here's one of the things that we could have talked about: the myth of mental illness, mental illness. Um, that was on my mind as a thing, and we might get to this down the road. It's a huge topic, but the myth of mental illness is something that we need to guard ourselves against. Um, just we're not going to deal with it. Just throwing it out there, right? Just <laughs> that is a, you just well, a great bomb, right? Good job, Chris. <laughs> stir, bomb on the, the podcast. Uh, um, you just lit the table on fire. <laughs> the, the the integrationist movement, right? The non lordship uh, movement. Uh, the the false gospel of a gospel without repentance. I feel like you you drill beneath mm-hmm. the surface. Those are the symptoms. Armenian. You get yeah. underneath it, and this is yeah. this is the foundation that's either there or not yeah. there. I think you're absolutely right, and and I I would I would nuance that a little bit and, and say that you really have kind of three three views, world views in this regard, and, and you know on the. Two opposite extremes. Well, you could even say there's something even more extreme than than Calvinism. We can talk. We can talk about hyper Calvinism. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know that would be far to the right of that. But on the other end of the spectrum, you have Pelagianism. Right. Uh, and and I think a lot of the church is is infected by just sheer Pelagianism, which is truly heretical. Right. Uh, in, in which there's there is no belief that God is sovereign over anything. That it's completely man's free will that is at work. Man is not really depraved at all. Uh, he's born really in a state of neutrality, and he can do good or evil equally. Um, and, and so, uh, so you have that view that I think really infects uh, aspects of the church unknowingly. Right. And and so I think Arminianism is more in the category of semi-Pelagianism, right. where they recognize certain truths of the Bible, but there's still this pull toward Pelagianism, right. and therefore there's a kind of compromise in their worldview. Um, so, for example, even though Arminianism would say that grace is necessary for our salvation, it's not sufficient, right? You mm-hmm. need grace but you also need your ability to cooperate with it. Right. And therefore, if you don't cooperate with, with grace, then, then it's null and void. Whereas in Calvinism, mm-hmm. grace is all sufficient, right. right? You could do nothing apart from the grace of God. Right. Well, we're getting ahead of ourselves because yeah. that takes us to our second, third, and fourth Fifth points. Um, so the second point of Arminianism is conditional election, conditional election versus in Calvinism, unconditional election. So their view of election, Arminius further taught that election was based upon the foreknowledge of God as to who would believe. In other words, man's act of faith is the condition for his being elected to eternal life, since God foresaw him exercising his free will in a positive choice or volition toward Christ. And so it's that God looked down the corridors of time, saw who would believe in Christ, and on that basis, he elected them to salvation. That's a conditional election. Calvinism says that's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, The election of God is unconditional. It's based on God's own choice, his own free will, the mystery of his own uh, sovereign love, loving those whom he will. And he sets that upon us before Time began before we made any choices, in, irrespective of what choices we would make, because the only choice that we can make is to reject God and to live in sin. And so uh, that's the second uh, big contrast between these two systems of thought. Um, did God choose us freely of his own free will, or did he choose us based on something that he foresaw that we would do? 
Uh, the third one is atonement issue, uh, universal versus a limited. Uh, this is the issue of did Jesus die for all men in general, creating a bank of salvation or redemption that people can draw from if they choose to, or did Jesus die specifically and directly and definitely for a particular group of people, individuals called the elect, uh, Calvinism would say it's the second, of course. So uh, within that, real quick, I think a good good point would be that if Jesus' blood is for all, based on the point of, in Arminian theology, those who choose, then it is possible that none choose. That's right. And this whole bank of Jesus' blood was wasted. Right, mm-hmm. that's right. That's the possibility that it you is. have to go for far enough down that that Jesus' blood is for everybody, and if it's based on f- only for those who choose, then it's possible for nobody to choose, and all that blood is wasted. That's right. So another imagine. way to say it is, see, it was a potential redemption, but not an a-, a potential redemption of everyone, but not an actual redemption yeah. of anyone. Yeah. Uh, or as this little book says, Christ's death provided grounds for God to save all men. However, each must exercise his free will to accept Christ. Right. Uh, so, yeah, it's a huge, huge difference uh, between really the intent, right? The design behind the death of Christ, the intent, the divine intent uh, is what's at stake here. Did God intend to make people savable or did he intend to save? Uh, did, he right. in, did he intend to um, put out there a potential redemption uh, depending on our response to it, uh, or did he he decide I'm God <laughs> and I will uh, I will ordain and decide who I will save whom I wish save, save whom I wish period. period and nope. so in Calvinism not one drop of blood is wasted right right in that theology yeah. sorry totally. yeah I just wonder uh, it really begs the question what's the draw I don't I don't get the draw of Arminianism. It 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 offers nothing in the way of it's assurance, fair. fairness, security. Yeah, that's right. It has it has it nothing. It just caters to, offer. to our human nature. I think it, it, just, appeal, it appeals it, it to appeals our appeals to our sinful sense. nature. Yeah. It appeals to our own depravity, mm. which sense they don't recognize. You right. know what I mean? Well, and, and in their defense, and and here's where they would. Here's how an Armenian would answer this: is they're trying to defend the character of God. In their defense, they would say that we see in the Bible a God of love, a God who created us in his own image, a God who didn't make us robots, who who made us to make choices. And these choices are real, and they are determinative. And so we are trying to preserve uh, a view of God that we believe the Bible teaches. Right, and so here's our list of verses to support our side, and then we have our list of verses to support our side, and then now we have this this division. Um, I think, you know, I think at times that can be part of the motive behind it. Uh, is they're trying to defend? I mean, this is their own language, right? They're trying to defend God from what they believe is a monstrous view of God, hmm. a, a view of God that turns us into robots. And our choices don't mean anything. And, of course, these are straw man arguments and they're caricatures of the real thing. But this is the language that they use. And and so they can get as equally passionate oh, and man, emotional. They'll, they'll call Calvinism demonic. Demonic you know? and yeah. monstrous. They can get as yeah. equally passionate as we can on, on our side because we're, we're essentially doing the same thing. Right? I mean, <clears throat> we are trying to defend what we believe the Bible teaches is the character of God. Uh, the true God of the Bible. That's what we're trying to uphold here and defend. And so I I would give them that benefit of the doubt. I I think, uh, I think there's other, uh, it also, it it just appeals to our sense of human fairness. Yeah. uh, Is a big part of it. Well, I think think they're trying to, I mean, it seems like uh, Arminians are trying to soften, kind of soften God somewhat and make him more approachable. But these things, we we believe that God is approachable, but he is approachable on his terms, right. not ours. Right. And we're trying, I mean, I think Armenians try to make God approachable on our, on human terms. So. Right. Yeah. I, I think it, it, it goes back to the very fundamental temptation that you see in the garden with, with Adam and Eve, which is, is to make ourselves our own gods. We want to be the captains mm-hmm. of right. our own fate. Right. Right. And, and it's the fundamental 
you know, core of human depravity is to place ourselves at the center of the universe and instead of God. Mm. And so I, I think that that comes into play when we theologize about salvation. We place ourselves as the linchpin. And I think the thing that the, the common thread in all of the five points of Arminianism is this notion of free will. And and it's central to their whole theology. If you if 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 their view of free will falls to pieces, then every one of these points falls to pieces because it's so central to their whole system. Right. And and so I think even the view that 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 they place God's love as the central attribute of God, which there's serious theological problems with doing that, it's really a byproduct of wanting to place this freedom of man and our own autonomy, <clears throat> right? Right, that we are <clears throat> we are the captains of our own fate. We are mm-hmm. we are a law unto ourselves, and and that's very central to this sort of identity, this ident- right. this worldview. And I think that's Chris is where you see this infecting right. all that's other right. kinds of things, that's right. you know, other theology, which goes back to the fall, goes back yeah. to the ver- the first acronym, the first letter. Is it total? Depravity, or is it partial? Uh, because we would say, in, in defense of free will, yes, man had a free will. It was Adam and Eve before the fall, and God gave them a real choice, and they made their choice. And so, <clears throat> I think I think the Calvinists would say we're talking about man as he is post fall, and Arminians are, are really still on the other side of the fall in some ways in their view of man's will. Not being in bondage to his nature, mm. not being in bondage to Satan. Yes, <laughs> did man ever have a free will? Absolutely, and not not ultimately free. That's only God has that. I mean, even man, even Adam and Eve's free will was under the sovereign plan of God. But but what they had before they sinned was they weren't bound to a corrupt nature, right? They weren't slaves of Satan. They were tempted by Satan, and then they yielded. And, and so when, when we talk about, I think it all begins with that first, that first step, and that, that will determine mm-hmm. what you believe about man's will. What Your view of the fall, I mean, Sproul's got a great quote, you get on, at T, you get on the train at T, you don't get off till P. Right. Your view of the fall will determine your view of man's will. Because we've got to go back to what was it pre and what was it post. That leads us into number four. Uh, it's called different things. Scott, you gave us some paperwork that has different labels from this guy's uh, label. He calls it obstructible grace. So we're doing the five points of Arminian. It's a free will, conditional election, universal atonement. Number four, they say we have a, uh, that God's grace is obstructible, or another term would be resistible. Uh, you've got something that says provisional, right? So in Calvinism, we say that God's grace is efficacious. Uh, it's irresistible. It will accomplish what God intends. Here's what they say about grace, the Arminian. He believed that since God wanted to, all men to be saved, he sent the Holy Spirit to woo all men to Christ. However, since man has absolute free will, he is able to resist God's will for his life, the Arminian order, parentheses, parentheses, the Arminian order being that man exercises his own will first, then he is born again. Although the Arminian says he believes that God is omnipotent, he insists that God's will to save all men can be frustrated by the finite will of man on an individual basis. Mm. And so God's grace is not sovereign and efficacious, it's obstructible, it's resistible. And that gets very nuanced and very complicated because we would say that sinners every day are resisting the will of God. And what we mean by that is they're resisting the prescribed will of God, the commands of God, the law mm-hmm. of God, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and every, every time we sin against the law of God and God's revealed will, we're doing that, believer or unbeliever alike. But what we're talking about here is God's secret or, or his ordained will that we don't know until it comes to pass, and that and part of that secret will of God is is the elect, who whom God has chosen, and we don't know whom God has chosen until people respond, right? Mm-hmm. And and so Calvinists would say, when God calls us, it's efficacious. We're going to respond. The Arminian would say, no, you have the ability to resist that all the way to hell, right? 
you can resist his call all the way into hell. Which is why, well, then we're getting into the final point, right. you know, which, you know, because they can resist it means that that there's the potential to lose your salvation, you know. So, so once in, in traditional Arminian theology, you know, your salvation is not secure, um, you know, because you always have the freedom to walk away from it. Yeah, if you chose it, you can choose it. Yes, yeah, right. for sure. Versus the opposite is if God chose— He's not going to unchoose. Right. 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 Election. True uh, adoption. If, if an election was done before the foundation of the world, what would cause God to reverse yeah. that? Um, if, he, if he did that, irrespective of our sin and our belief, what we would do or not do, Jacob, mm-hmm. Esau, <laughs> what, why would he ever reverse it? It's interesting to me because we all have our Bibles and it becomes a Bible war, you know, <laughs> uh, between these two camps. You know, the Arminian's going to, push forth the rich young ruler as their example. They're, here's our evidence. Here's the rich young ruler. Christ interacted with him. Uh, he went away sad. Uh, Jesus told him what to do, Called him, essentially called him in a, from an external sense, a general sense, right? Sell everything you have, come follow me, right? I mean, this, this was the external a choice. He gave him a choice, it. gave him a, put this before him, and he, he, he had many of the world's goods. He turned away. He went away sad. Jesus didn't chase him down, didn't tackle him, didn't send, didn't send the 12 after him. He let him go, right? So that would be, that would be the Arminians. Here's my exhibit A. Our exhibit A is Lazarus. <laughs> Lazarus dead for four days. His body's corrupting. It's going to smell. Don't move, don't move the stone. He's wrapped up. He's in, he's in the grave clothes. And Jesus comes to that tomb, says, move that stone. Lazarus, come forth. Right? right. Efficacious. That's a sign of John of what Jesus does in salvation, just like healing the blind man's eyes in chapter 9 of John. So... It's interesting. We all got our Bible verses. We all got our illustrations. Um, I think what we would all say is the, yeah, they can make some points, and we have to respond to those respectfully. But I think what we would all say is the weight of evidence from cover to cover. Outweighs. Yeah. Outweighs. By far. When, when you deal with the whole Bible, and, you, and you're honest with everything that's here, and you say, I'm going to let the Bible speak for itself, that it outweighs the arguments of the mm-hmm. Of the Armenian side, yeah. Well, God's chosen a people from the beginning, right? He there there are lots of nations and people that He did not choose, and so why why do we want to limit God's free will to choose for Himself? I, going back to the Lazarus example, uh, had some interesting perspective on on that this this week. They, I guess there was a there was a belief that. After about within about three days, somebody could theoretically rise from the dead. Right in in Jewish culture, there was there was like a window of opportunity that they could still be re I don't know revived revived. <laughs> uh, and Jesus waited until the fourth day. Uh, I also heard there's some discussions with family that he was likely buried in a community tomb. And this is, I think this is the strongest point. He was likely buried in a, like a collective community type tomb. Oh, right. And if Jesus had just said, come, come forth, <laughs> right. all of them would have come out, <laughs> but he called Lazarus by name. By name. Uh, I think that's, that's a strong point to this. Which, which uh, reminds you of John. Irresistible that, grace. That, that my sheep hear my voice. Okay. Yeah. They will you know, follow they, me. Yeah. It says they will. So the last point, and Scott alluded to it, and I love, I love to talk about this one because this is where Armenians become inconsistent uh, big time. Uh, this is where they steal from Calvinism, and they're not consistent with their system all the way through. So the, the fifth point of the Arminianism is falling from grace, or you can lose your salvation. Uh, so the way this is described in this little book is it's the logical outcome of the preceding portions of the system. If man cannot be saved by God unless it's man's will to be saved, then man cannot continue in salvation unless he continues to will to be saved. I don't know that I would have said it that way. I think God's going to give us the, the continuation of our will <laughs> to be saved uh, through faith. But what they, what they basically do is they say, well, we're going to get, uh, if, if you're a consistent Armenian, 
uh, from f- start to finish, then you have to come to terms with the fact you could lose your salvation. You could walk away. You could have been saved, truly believed, but now you decide to truly not believe and apostatize. We would say that person was never saved to begin with. Mm-hmm. They would say they were saved, and there is no such thing as eternal security uh, or that every Christian is going to persevere to the end. The, f- the fifth point of Calvinism is P, perseverance of the saints. So Calvinism goes total depravity, unconditional election, limited or definite atonement, irresistible grace, and then P, perseverance of the saints, that God will preserve our faith and we will preserve an obedience and faith to the end. None of the elect will fall away from the faith. Um, most Arminians that I know are four-point Arminians, just like you've got a lot of four-point Calvinists who don't like definite atonement, but most Armenians in our circles, most Baptist Armenians, most, I don't know about Methodists, a lot of Baptist Armenians are (laughs) four-pointers because they'll get to this fifth one and say, oh, no, no, once saved, always saved, right? Uh, So so what's the difference between once saved, always saved and perseverance of the saints? How would would you guys describe the difference between those two things? Well, I think I think the once saved, always saved tends to be connected to easy believism, um, and, and so there's no real perseverance involved in in the sanctification process, which is a whole topic in and of itself. Right. Um, but you know, I, I like to call this particular view Hotel California theology because you know God was God was not sovereign. In their coming to salvation, but somehow God is now sovereign in keeping them (laughs) from leaving salvation. And so if someone genuinely wanted to apostatize, they could not. And because they're they're eternally secure, you know they they already made that decision of faith of their own free accord, and so that now locked them in forever into this position. And so so you know the the Hotel California right. song is yeah. basically you can check out any time you want, but you, you can never leave. leave. <laughs> you know, and, and so you know that's where the inconsistency I think lies. Well, Aren't here's some, here's where the problem with it is that I've got an uncle who's a militant atheist. But at some point in his childhood, right. he responded to an altar call, and but he has lived his life completely devoid of any kind of spirituality or any sort of Godward focus. Uh, I mean, t- quite the opposite. So, but if you believe once saved, always saved, you you got to believe that we're going to see him in heaven, right? Aren't there some Armenians that would say that? I mean, aren't there some Armenians that would say? A person can apostatize and reject. Oh, for the sure. Faith. Well, like, but if they made a decision, yeah, that they're they, still they're, in. I mean, you hear examples of people who are strong on that point that would say, "I know people. Right. I can give you examples. This person was a Christian. Right. They were with Christ. They they obeyed Christ. They were a godly husband and a godly wife. And they did a. And then they have now rejected. I've seen it. They have. They have turned their back on God and and and. And lost their faith, right? right? And and so, but there's problems with that. <laughs> yeah, right, right. right. So well, this is this becomes a huge counseling issue. I see it all the time. You know, particularly with parents, you know, whose adult children have abandoned exactly. the faith and and they cling to. But but I but know they, my child yeah. made this decision. He, you know, he walked the altar. He prayed the sinner's prayer. Right. You mm-hmm. know, he got baptized, mm-hmm. and, and so I know that he's saved. I know he's saved. But they're not. Per- they have never persevered in their faith. Their faith never produced a transformed life uh, that that had lasting effects mm-hmm. in that person's life. And so they're clinging yep. to this false view right. of conversion. Right. And, and uh, what I would say to them, that person in this conversation is still alive. I would say, preach the gospel to them. Mm-hmm. Continue preaching the gospel to them, and beg God to have mercy yeah. on them. Right? Yeah, because. Right. He has had mer- – he is showing mercy by – he. Is, they're not dead yet, right? So we don't know what that timeline is, right? Mm-hmm. God could – That's right. – have saved them, right? Mm-hmm. Could have elected them. And, and so it's still, a, 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 um, it's still up to God. <laughs> right. That's right. It's always been up to God. And, yeah. that's, and that's a good segue into kind of the wrap-up of this, I think, and that's implications. And so there are implications for parenting. 
and how we view childhood conversions and how we view our, our grown children who do not walk with the Lord and what do they need, you know, and, and there's implications for preaching. Am I going to be a topical preacher, scratching, itching ears? Avoiding, to, avoiding tough uh, subjects. Right. Passages. Is everything going to always be, here's five ways to be a better husband, six ways to be a better parent, seven ways to be successful at your job? You know, am I going to be that kind of preacher? Or am I going to I'm going to preach the whole counsel of God, line by line, book by book, not skipping around, not picking and choosing? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it 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 informs our our counseling. Am I going to adopt the world's methods, the world's viewpoints, the world's worldviews mm-hmm. about fallen man, and and go down that path of psychology, psychiatry, integrationism? They need drugs. It's sickness, not sin, et cetera, et cetera. You know that's a that's a huge implication. It's gonna it's gonna have a ton of implications on evangelism. Uh, what do I think I can accomplish when I'm talking to an unsaved person? It's gonna have a huge impact on how we do missions. You know, is it missions by the book or is it missions by the world? Mm-hmm, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, can we persuade people into the kingdom? Do we just need to give them enough evidence? Does evidence, it's going to have implications on how we title our books. Mm-hmm. Does evidence <laughs> demand a verdict? Mm-hmm. No, it doesn't. No, mm-hmm. evidence does not demand a verdict. So it gets into your into your apologetic Apologi- methodology. Methodology, apologetics, <laughs> yeah. defense of the faith, on and on and on and on. And I think, I think if you drill down past all those symptoms, you're going to find it's either Arminianism, or it's Calvinism. It's either doctrines of grace, or it's uh, some form of this semi-Pelagianism uh, that that really Im- imbibes the the views of the world, the views of an unbeliever about human nature. Um, anything else, Dad? Where are we on time? Forty. No. Yeah, we're close enough. Forty-two, forty-two, 42 minutes. Close enough. I, I, real minutes. quick, I think the the heartache for the Armenians and their viewpoint of Calvinism is that how can you tell me that God created all these people, yeah, and He only chose some, right? And so I always do an illustration when I'm talking about total depravity, which informs the rest of the points, which is what mm-hmm. you said, Chris is I'll draw a line across the dry erase board and put an arrow pointing down and say, this is where we all are. Would you agree, right? You can ask anybody. Would you agree this is what we deserve? We all deserve to go to hell. Why do we deserve to go? Because we're all sinners. Yes, 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 right? Nobody argues with that. I said, what if God, in his goodness and for his own glory and good pleasure, and I'll, I'll draw a little dip under that line. I said, he chooses one person. Is God unfair? They didn't choose the other Eight billion, but he just chose one for his own because he's God. He can do this. Chooses one person. Is he fair? They go, yeah. I don't have a problem with that. You're like, I can see that. I said, okay. What if God chooses a thousand? Ooh, man. Well, now we're starting to get a little like, well, why aren't I part of that? Then, what if God <laughs> chooses ten million yeah. for Himself for His own good pleasure? That's where it starts to get like. Well, what about these other, you know, uh, right. seven billion, whatever, right? right yeah. And so that is the thing. And, and and at the end of the day, we are saying God is completely good, right, just, and sovereign to choose whom he wills. And if it's zero, it's zero. If it's one, it's one. And if it's 10 million, it's 10 million. Right. And those arguments are based on straw men. Yeah. You know, it's the whole, you know, I really, really want to be saved, but I'm not a Lex, so too bad and then it's the it's the one that goes kicking and screaming to heaven because yeah. he hates god and and doesn't want to be there those two people don't exist <laughs> don't exist yeah there's no one going to be in hell saying well I, I wanted to go to heaven but god didn't choose me that person right. doesn't exist mm-hmm. right yeah. right and the and the thought i think a good illustration too is so uh, humanity post fall is is all corrupt and rebellious running away from god and we're like a we're like a r- rushing river toward a destructive falls, you know, and we're all we're all going that way, and that's the way we want to go, and we're living it up. And we're partying. We prove it by we're, our own actions. We're partying yeah. on the way, yeah, you we know, prove and, it. and yeah. we've been and there's prophets on the shore saying, "Don't go there, danger, danger, turn around, get out." No, oh, he's a fool, he's an idiot. This is the good life, right? And it's a wide river, and it's a rushing river. It's the way we're all going, and God has just decided to come into that mass of humanity that all deserve and are going to destruction to 
carve out of that some, few, there are a few who find it. He carves out some to turn around for his own glory, for his own for his own good pleasure. And so that at the end, God's grace is magnified and his holiness and his justice is magnified. Yeah. God is glorified in heaven. He's glorified in hell. He's glorified in salvation. He's glorified in damnation. He's mm-hmm. glorified in everything. And that's the way he's designed it. Mm-hmm. And and he takes away all of our boasting by the fact that we were going the way we wanted to go until he turned us around to mm-hmm. himself. Yeah. Amen. You could say the center of Calvinism is the glory of God. Right. <laughs> the center of Arminianism is more the glory of man. Mm-hmm. Okay. Sums it up. Yeah. I'll pray. Okay. Lord, thank you for your sovereign grace, your love that uh, knows no end for your own. Thank, thankful for what Jesus said, uh, that he laid down his life for the sheep, and his sheep know his voice, and they respond they follow him and you give them eternal life and no one can snatch them out of your hand lord it's all there in john 10 really all of it Uh, we thank you for that thank you that you've saved us by your grace you keep us by your grace and you'll save other sinners still to come by your grace and help us to preach and proclaim this with boldness and clarity uh, till our dying breath we pray in jesus name amen thanks for listening to the kerrville bible church pastors podcast We want to be a resource for you and answer the biblical, theological, or pastoral questions that you may have. Send them to us via email at questions at kervillebiblechurch.org or leave us a text or voicemail at 830-321-0349.